Hello and welcome to the Science Fiction and Fantasy Marketing Podcast, the show where we help you establish your author brand, increase the size of your audience, and sell more books. I'm Lindsay Baroker and I'm here with Jeffrey Poole and Joe Lalo, and this week it is just us. And we're going to talk to you about boxed set strategies, including uh, multi-author box sets and also doing putting together solo bundles on your own, and a little bit too on uh, like anthologies, multi-author, or just short story collections of your own. We've kind of touched on this in the past in various episodes, but we haven't really dedicated a show to it, so we're going to kind of try to take it from the very basics to like why you want to do this and how you get started to um, some of the strategies that we use for these things. Uh, before we jump into that, we haven't spoken just amongst us for about a month or so, so why don't we have a little news and tell everybody what we're working on. One of you guys can go first. All right. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Well, I'm working on uh, two books simultaneously. My fantasy is just about done, and my mystery is, I would say, about two thirds of the way done. And uh, it's coming along nicely, don't you? <laughs> coming along nicely, and uh, no complaints. So I hope to have something. Actually, I hope to have both of them done. At least the fantasy done by the end of the month, and the mystery done. I would say maybe first week of uh, of uh, September. Cool. Um, as for me, I am uh, just finishing up. I just got the cover for my next, uh, well, basically the next release that I'll be explaining why I should not have chosen to write and market this book. But uh, this will be the new The Other Eight in terms of biggest mistake I ever made. But until then, you know, optimism. I have the, the cover. I just wrote the, bl uh, the blurb today, and I'll probably be doing a, a pre-order for it in the coming week or so. And then um, other than that, I'm writing it. Oddly enough, I'm writing some bonus material for a boxed set of my sci-fi series. And uh, so this this is very fresh information that I will be giving in terms of my techniques on this stuff. And uh, that's, that's, my, uh, that's the announceable book stuff for me right now. All right, cool. Yeah, I'm just doing a box set, too, of my first three books in my sci-fi series. So that was sort of why this came to mind. And... I'm also was Carolyn Gockel who was on here earlier in the year. We're doing a sci-fi box set too with a bunch of authors, so it's all fresh on my mind too. Um, no big news here. I'm working on my editor has the sixth book in my Fallen Empire series. I've been really getting those out this summer, planning eight books total. Uh, the, the books are still selling well, not as well as they were earlier in the summer, it, but they're still like the first five or the five that are out there. I think are all under 1,500 in the Amazon store still, so that's pretty good. <laughs> it's sad when that's like, oh man, that's such a bummer now. I'm not in the top 500. But, you know, it's weird how your reality shift. How uh, You always want more, I guess. Even when you see other people doing better, I think, no matter what level you're at. And you're like, man, how come I can't just be in the top 200 for three months too? <laughs> but and things are going well. And like I said, I'm putting together the bundle. So, uh, yeah, we're going to talk about that stuff, but let's do a couple of listen, yeah, listener questions first. Um, and actually, the first thing here is just a, a comment from a listener, Jesper Schmidt. Uh, several, a couple months ago, we talked about fantasy map making and I suppose science fiction too, making your own maps for your worlds, and how it's uh, not always something we do because we don't have that knack for it, and it would involve paying someone to do it and working with them to get it just right. But uh, he's published a book called Fantasy Map Making. Appropriate, appropriately named, with a, a lot of advice for designing your own worlds, and he's offering uh, 10 free downloads for our listeners, uh, and I'm going to put the link in the show notes on our site, marketingsff.com, episode 95, and it's just going to be first come, first serve, so if you're interested, go, hit, go get that. Uh, today is August the show later tonight, so the sooner you get there, the sooner you can grab one. And uh, also, if you miss it, the ebook is for sale on Amazon. Uh, I didn't check and see if it's Kindle Unlimited, but it might be in the other stores too. Uh, I'll put the link to his site for more information on it too on uh, episode 95. All right, and then, okay, first question. Bryce asks, I was wondering if the three of you have any favorite books on writing that you would suggest. You guys want to go first? 
Yeah, the one I've used uh, a bunch of times when I first started out, especially if you're just starting out and you don't have money for an editor or anything, there's a, a book quite literally called available at Amazon called Self-Editing for Fiction Writers um, from Rennie Brown and Dave King. I found that incredibly helpful. And if anything, it told me that <laughs> you really do want an editor. But, but uh, that's pretty much the one I've been using. I, I don't really use any others. Maybe I should. <laughs> but that's the one I first use, and I still take a look at it every once in a while. As for me, I have, uh, when I was in college, I had a couple of the style guides. I think I had Shrunken White, uh, Elements of Style, uh, and I looked at that. But um, once you have an editor, really put the style guide down. Uh, as long as you're not way off, then it's really not that much of an issue. Uh, but the one writing book that I've sort of taken a lot of lessons from is Stephen King's On Writing. And uh, I actually haven't read it. My brother read it. And we have had many lengthy discussions about the advice that Stephen King gives whenever this problem comes up. So I basically have the audiobook version in the form of my brother dictating to me periodically. And there's a lot of really good information in, in that. And I don't follow all of it. I don't any any writing book written by a writer is teaching you how to be that kind of writer. So you take what is useful and you leave the rest, or else you're just going to be carbon copying their style. But on writing is the one for me. Is your brother a writer as well? Uh, he's tried on multiple occasions, but he, as he puts it, he'll get a couple, uh, a couple dozen pages done, and then the, the baseball season starts, and then he'll just watch baseball. <laughs> I see. Okay, just curious. Yeah. All right, and for myself, I ve very helpfully have absolutely no books to recommend on this subject. I've don't think I've ever read a writing book. I'm very much a I cannot learn from books person. I think you're a kinetic learner if you have to do it yourself. To t you know, I was good at like uh, in Taekwondo <laughs> we have to do the katas and stuff for karate, uh, things where you doing physically doing something and then memorizing it the same way and piano things like that I was fine at. But learning from a book was never my style, which seems weird for a writer, but. There you go. And I actually tried to listen to Stephen King's On Writing because it gets recommended all the time. And I felt like it was kind of autobiographical. And I, I was like... It's about 50% biography, 50% uh, instruction. Maybe I didn't get far enough, but I don't remember many actual tips on writing. Um, I will say that um, Brandon Sanderson actually has, not books, but he has a number of lectures on YouTube. You can go look them up. They're on there for free. Uh, and really great for science fiction and fantasy authors. It's, that's his thing. And uh, I'll put the links to those, or at least the first one. He's got a whole series of them in the show notes also. So that might be something to check out. Or if you're like me and you learn better by doing and kind of being corrected by someone or by critiquing someone else and seeing what doesn't work, definitely check out uh, writing workshops. I was a member of the science fiction and fantasy online writing workshop off and on for several years, and that's really how I learned um, Everything I've learned, <laughs> if I haven't learned some of the stuff, don't blame them, but uh, it was a great experience because people just shred your stuff apart, and after you stop crying and weeping and wondering if you're ever going to be a writer, you start to realize, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, I see what you're saying, that makes sense, and so some people don't like writing workshops because they say that it kind of makes you all the same, but I think it's just part of learning, and then eventually you again find your own voice, and that kind of thing, but I, I found that very useful. So that's my two cents on the subject. So if you don't learn anything from books, how do you do when you uh, have to put together, say, some furniture? I can follow pictures. <laughs> so I, I, I've done Ikea desks <laughs> and that kind of thing. Actually, that was my example I was going to bring up, is how do you do when you go to Ikea? <laughs> but now I've done enough of those, because every time you move, I always for some reason would get the L-shaped desk and you can never unassemble those so you have to just kind of leave it wherever it is because uh, they come with glue, a lot of them, and you glue the dowels or whatever and so I've put together now like at least 10 of those and several years ago I said no more, I'm not buying any more furniture that is not made from solid wood and already assembled so that's the rule now. Alright, next question. Uh, Scott was asking, um, have you ever done an episode covering how to transition from selling exclusively on Amazon to selling on multiple platforms without getting punished by Amazon? And uh, if you can port over reviews and things like that. And I answered Scott in an email already, but you, you know, you'd have to start over on every platform. You can't get your reviews from the other ones onto the new ones. 
Uh, as far as getting punished by Amazon, it, it depends if you're in KDP Select uh, slash Kindle Unlimited, as we've talked about in the past. You do get a sales ranking boost every time your book is borrowed. So if you suddenly leave the program, you're not going to get those borrows anymore, and definitely your sales ranking could drop. It, it probably will if you, you know if you are getting borrows. Um, but if you were already not selling that much on Amazon, not getting that many borrows, it probably won't make a too noticeable of a difference. So the qu the thing is, you are kind of going to get punished if you're uh, <laughs> against other authors who are in Kindle Unlimited. And it's just if you want to go wide and you want to you know, potentially build up reader bases in different countries and different bookstores. It's a choice you have to make. And like I said, if you're not selling that well on Amazon anyway, then there's why not just try it elsewhere. But if you are selling really well there and you're in KDP Select, you've got to think about it because you probably will lose some sales ranking. Uh, do you guys you, have thoughts? I'll say if you have a, a nice, good, solid core of readers and fans, you, and if they've left you message or messages, <laughs> reviews on Amazon, you can always ask them like, "Hey, would you mind considering, you know, leaving those reviews on, you know, Smashwords, Kobo, you know, Apple, I mean, wherever?" Because I've done that on a couple of them when I'm first getting started over there, and most of them, you know, say, "Okay, yeah, sure, no problem." And they just do a simple copy and paste and do it. So, I mean, that's one way to possibly get the reviews over. Yeah, if you have readers that are have accounts on like Kobo and Amazon, you could definitely ask them. You never know. I think you might have to have accounts to leave reviews, though. Uh, I mean, it's, I th I think you might have to, but I remember I I know I've left reviews. Usually, whenever I leave a review, I'll any place I can that I do have accounts, or even if I don't, if it'll let me give it a review, I'll do it. Otherwise, okay, if I don't have an account there and I don't see myself using the service, then I won't bother with it. But yeah, usually you should be able to, but it, it's been a while since I've done that, so we'll see. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Thanks there's also um, there's also uh, Goodreads. Obviously, you can you can mm -hmm. review on things, and there's a lot of bookstores that will either pull from Goodreads or link to Goodreads for reviews. So that's another way that you can sort of get some of your uh, like if you if you have the ear of your readers, and you can get them to to dupe their reviews on Goodreads if they haven't already. And that's at least some way to try to carry over some of your Amazon success elsewhere. But again, it's not so much that Amazon punishes you unless you dropped out of, like, unless you violate the rules of exclusivity. The only punishment you have is that you no longer get the bonuses of exclusivity. Very right. true. And uh, yeah, if you have a mailing list, you can definitely more easily ask your readers to help out by posting the reviews on the other stores. Yeah, good. Goodreads is a good one, and also I know there's no more Shelfari. You know, they pretty much phase that into Goodreads. So, all right. Well, last question is just a couple of people actually in different months have asked if we could discuss world building, and kind of what we do, and if we have any tips. You know, we're kind of a marketing show, so we don't often go into the writing and craft side of things. But I thought we could kind of briefly. If there's anything you guys have, what what you guys do for world building, and if you have any advice to share. On on mine, I mean, obviously, I, I've I've built my fantasy world, and I will typically go into each area as I write a book that actually covers that particular area. I don't need to actually go into the world, at least for me, anyways. I don't have to have every last little detail, everything spelled out. I mean, it's to me, it's actually more fun as you know, take the readers through a journey. And say, okay, well, we haven't really explored you know underwater civilization over here. Let's go take a look. Or we haven't really explored the, the southern mountains over here. Let's go take a look. So, yeah, I mean, I, I'll just pretty much go as I mean, if I have to explain certain things, you know, so be it. Like, and this is how magic works. You know, the dragons live over here. They live X amount of years. But when it comes to sp spelling every out every last little detail, that I don't do. It's kind of more fun to discover it later on down the line. Yeah, um, I feel like like the two most important things in world building are uh, to explain the things that aren't in the world that we all live in, how they're different, how they exist within this world, and explain the things that do exist in in the world we live in and how they may be different in this world. So typically, what I would do is as I as I encounter a thing like currency. Then I would either, well, are we going to just call it gold coins? Or are we going to give it a name? Uh, you have to establish, if you give it a name, that it is currency so people know what you're talking about. And that goes with everything, like if there's fancy outfits or anything like that. And a couple other things that I find I try to do just to be consistent. Uh, different regions, I try to come up with a, a naming scheme for characters. Like I have a, I, one of my settings is Tresser, and I try to, the, the sort of the rule for the names of Tressers, there's a lot of double vowels. 
and just so that everyone from that area sort of has the same feel. And a lot of times the way I'll achieve that is just like I will sort of pick a counterpart region uh, in the real world. Like Discworld, if you've read Discworld, there are separate sections of Discworld that represent, you know, for parody purposes, virtually every part of, of, uh, of the planet Earth within sort of a medieval setting. And uh, I, I do a little bit of the same thing where it's like, well, this region is going to be roughly Eastern European. This region is going to be sort of Anglo-Saxon. Down here is going to be sort of Middle Eastern. And further down is going to be sort of African. And it will just sort of give me like sort of a, a temperature and a flavor that I can mix in. And uh, the other thing is a map, as we was discussed earlier. It's handy to have a map, even if it's not like a fancy one you'd share with others, just so you get the locations right. You don't want to say they headed east for three days and end up in a place that is west. Uh, although only really uh, uh, detailed readers would run into that. And then um, other than that, uh, well, yeah, that's, that's what those are the notes I have. So just the, oh, uh, if once you develop the world, uh, make sure you're consistent. I actually ended up making a wiki because I had to so frequently go back to check the little details that it was getting to be a pain. So I created a little personal wiki for myself to keep track of, of the little details. Have you ever thrown a glossary in at the end of your book? I haven't thrown in a glossary. I don't have that many made-up words uh, for the first for the for the for my my fantasy. A lot of the stuff I actually avoided even using units of measure. Like it was all paces and days of travel. It wasn't until I got to the fourth book that I finally decided, okay, there are miles because this is getting really hard to keep track of. Been there, uh, done that. I was like, I, I did the same thing. Avoid, avoid, avoid. Oh, the hell with it. Yes, smiles. This. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's uh, so. There's that. I yeah. Only have a handful of made-up words, and typically, it, uh, I will sort of phase out any big chunks of foreign language, just by having it translated more or less for the reader, yeah. because otherwise, it can be it can be a real pain. All right. Well, I will be the first to admit that world building is probably my weakest area as a writer. It's not super interesting to me as a reader. I tend to skim a lot when <laughs> we're getting, especially if it goes in depth and it's not, you know, integrated into the story very well. But I, one thing I have learned is definitely uh, I use Scrivener, and it allows you to do a lot of notes and stuff over on the side. And I will, since I kind of world build on the fly. You know, as I'm writing the first few books in the series, I'm kind of fleshing out the world at the same time. I just, anytime I make up something, I put it over here. You know, I've got it organized and over in my Bible, I guess you could call it. I've got like, you know, these are curse phrases and I list things added there. These are the names of my ships that I've made up for my various militaries, uh, languages, religion, anything that's just, especially if you think, even if you don't think that you're going to need to reference it later, it's a really good idea to put it over there on the side, because I didn't do that with my first series, honestly, and I would end up avoiding mentioning specific things in later books because I couldn't remember if I had named something. <laughs> like, I think I was five or six books in the series, and my town didn't have an official name. It was uh, Stumps, there was a, because of all the headless statues, but I, I couldn't remember if I'd actually named the city anywhere in the book, so I just never brought it up. <laughs> Finally, I think I asked a reader, have I ever named the city? You know, somebody that read the books a couple times. They're like, no, no, no. I'm like, okay, I'm going to name the city. Now I have book five. So definitely the kind of building the Bible as you go has really been helpful to me. And this is actually another thing where I like to write. I found the, the last couple series, if you can write the first three books before you actually publish anything, we've talked about that from a marketing point of view, like why that can be a good idea, but it also gives you a chance to flesh out your world more. Sometimes I'll come up with an idea as I'm writing book three that I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, that's good, and then I can go back and integrate it into one and two because I haven't actually published anything yet. So if you're a world builder on the fly, that can definitely be a useful idea. Um, I think a lot of people, a lot of times in fantasy especially, you'll find worlds that are kind of based on something, medieval Spain or Mesopotamia, and I don't think that's a bad idea uh, because you end up with a world that's going to make sense. Uh, I know it's, we want to be creative, right, and make up our own, oh, what's a uh, political system that we haven't seen too much of, and then what's a monetary kind of system that we haven't made too much of? But if you're not careful, you'll get a, you'll get something that doesn't actually make sense that probably could never logically happen. Maybe that's okay. Maybe only your historian people will really notice that some things wouldn't make sense. But you will have readers call you on it if you've got 
you know, really <laughs> educated heroine or something when you haven't really made a way that people could be that educated in your world that you've created. <laughs> so just something to think about. Uh, yeah, that's my only thoughts on that. Do you guys have any more world building thoughts? I was just thinking, yeah, it's it's really interesting when you're like when you're building your own world and you forget something or else you mention something once and never mention it again and then a review or several reviewers down the line go, Whatever happened to this? You mentioned it in book two, paragraph three, line this to them like um flipping through the book. Oh yeah, how about that? Okay. <laughs> Thanks. I'll I'll add it again in the next book. But yeah, it's always always interesting when you have readers correct you. Or else you like you were saying, ask a reader, say, Hey, you're pretty good at reading memory. Did I ever do this? Oh, I did? Okay, damn, thanks. Yeah, uh, I've often said that uh, readers remember my stuff better than I do because I'm writing it to get out of my head and they're reading it to get it into their head. So it's, you know, it sticks around better when it's on the in, you know, input. But I will say this too in terms of uh, keeping track of things. In almost every single thing I've ever written, the issue of exchange rate and like currency exchange. Well, how much? How many silver coins to a gold coin? And how many copper to a silver? I always lose track of that stuff, and I never am smart enough to make it even numbers. It's always like, well, it's five of these and twenty of those. So uh, go easy on yourself and come up with round numbers. Yeah, if you have like a favorite three-digit number, it's like okay, you know, you have seven of these or equals two, then one of these, and then three of these equal one. Just incorporate that in there. So when you ever have to ask yourself, oh man, how many of the bronze are worth the, the silver? How many silver are worth the gold? And right now I'm thinking about um, the, my world. I'm like, I don't know. That's what the search option is for, and the Kindles and the, and the iPads. I can just do a search. Okay, where's my first mention of this word? There's the answer. So. Make it easy. Yeah, notably J.K. Rowling uh, fell into that trap. Apparently, uh, Harry Potter has got different currencies, and they are inconsistent across the uh, inconsistent in value across the entire series. So, it's a uh, if you if you make this mistake, you're in good company. <laughs> Will you sell as well as her if you're inconsistent? No. Well, I'm sure that's that was the draw <laughs> with the inconsistency. Right, people wanted to nitpick, so they read the books. Uh, my only final parting advice on world building is don't co get so wrapped up in it that you never write your novel. Because I've definitely met people that go the opposite of direction of me. It's usually guys. You guys love to build your worlds. <laughs> that uh, they just they spend you know like a decade or two developing this world. And uh, game masters, dungeon masters can be some of the <laughs> some of the culprits there. And that's fine. I love it. You know, but you, but make sure you use it and get your novels written and out there. Yeah, a friend of mine has spent, at this point, probably six years making a map of a world that he's not written any plot for yet. <laughs> I hope it's a good map. Yeah, I'd, good. Love to be, I'd love to be able to get to a spot where I could actually do something like J.R.R. Tolkien did, where he wrote, like, what was it, the Cimmerillion or the Cimmerillion? But actual, actual history of the world back two, 3,000 years ago. I'm like, yeah... <sighs> I go back about 100 years. That's about it. <laughs> if I have to go back, so be it. I'll make something up. But that's as far as I go. All righty. Well, on that note, let's jump into our main topic of boxed sets. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start off talking about one author sets, like bundling up maybe the first three or four books in your series, especially if you're going on to write more books in the series. And, um, you know, why would you want to do this? Uh, we've talked about it before. Basically, what you can do is once you've got this bundle, you know, you've got the little 3D box set, three books. First off, it's a way to maybe attract a different audience because you can maybe put these into different categories than your main books are in. You know, you only get two on Amazon uh, unless you can use some keywords to get into some other ones. But for some people, they have maybe three or four categories that their books would actually be a good fit for and they have to narrow it down. So this gives you a chance to try another category. And you can also try a different blurb. I did that with my Dragon Blood books. I had the the first blurb of the first book was very kind of a romance style, male POV, female POV, their POV. And then with the box set, I made it more, I was trying to make it work for all three of the first books, so I made it more just a kind of an epic fantasy sounding thing. And uh, that was the box set that actually got a good book bub. You know, I went to 99 cents and stuck for a long time in the top 250 of Amazon and kind of made that series for me and got it to be one of my more popular series out there. So I thank that boxed set for that. And um, 
another reason if when you do run a sale like I'm saying uh, you like you might start out publishing it as just maybe a dollar off maybe maybe it's 899 because your individual titles are 399 399 and 299 or something and you're putting them all together and then giving a dollar off to anybody that wants to buy the bundle but if you then take those three that box set and maybe it's been out for a while it's got some reviews and you're able to snag a book bub ad or even some of the ads on the other sites uh, and you're willing to drop it to 99 cents which you might not do if that, that's your whole series but if you have eight books in your series that kind of can be your starter library and uh, if you sell enough at BookBub I mean you could sell like thousands of copies of that easily if not more with a 99 cent ad and get a whole bunch of new readers into your series and also as we've talked about before those BookBub ads can be hard to come by a lot of people are listening I'm sure have gotten the, a lot of rejections and one of the things when the BookBub people have been interviewed before is they've said, you know, among other things, they like it when they can do a big discount for their for their readers. So usually we might be discounting a $2.99 book down to $0.99, cents and oh, okay, that's $2. But if you're taking a $9 box set and discounting it to $0.99, cents, you know, the readers really seem to love that because it's a great deal for them. So that's another reason to, to do, put it out there. Um, do you guys want to chime in at all before I <laughs> keep going? Well, I have a question for you real quick. Because I, I haven't ever had a book bub, although I've tried a few times. What is the going price for in fantasy for a book bub ad? Do we know? They've got a list on their site, and it changes. They raise it pretty much any time they get however many million more subscribers. And it's different if you're doing perma-free or versus 99 cents. I just got one that's going to be for a perma-free science fiction book and it's about three hundred dollars and I think that was like maybe two fifty for the US, fifty for the UK and everywhere else is how it broke down. And it's more for fantasy. I believe it's fantasy has a bigger mailing list. Um usually, usually I think I want to say it's like four hundred, five hundred in that area for a ninety nine cent book. But at the same time I've you know sold two thousand copies or more when they're ninety nine cents. I I think there's only been one time I didn't make my money back on a book bub, and it was when I was doing one of my pen name books, which is science fiction romance, and they said, mm, we're not putting this in sci-fi, we'll put, give you paranormal romance, and it, you know, it's not really a good fit. So that was probably the one time I didn't make my money back. Good to know. I was curious. I know it's expensive, but I was, kind of last, last time I looked, I thought it, I saw it was like, 300, 350, so based on that, I'm sure it's up into the 400s by now. Well, if you get one, just take it. <laughs> take the money. Put it on a credit card if you have to. You know, it's, it's good. Yeah, Especially, yeah. I'm coming up with uh, fantasy book number six, and I've been debating on putting uh, like the first three, but I'm kind of curious about that because the first three, that ends in that cliffhanger because I've got the cliffhanger between number three and the four. I'm like, do I make it four in a box set? Should I leave it three and be completely evil? I've always kind of wondered about that. Ooh, so that was actually a listener question. or re What do we have, listeners, readers? Yeah, <laughs> something like that. Uh, on Twitter, Dale Ivan Smith asked, is boxing the first three in a series in a box set the magic number? And, you know, I would say depends on the length of your series what your goal is. If you only have three, three makes sense, obviously, if you have a trilogy. If you have four and that's the end of your series, you might just put them all into a set. But I really like it where you are you still have more full-price novels to offer, If you're especially if you're dropping it to 99 cents for a sale like this. But if there's a cliffhanger, mm -hmm. I don't know, that might actually be good because then they'll go on and hopefully buy book four. Yeah, I can just see like, oh yeah, you know, book three is great, and son of a, they let end it in a cliffhanger. Therefore, I had to buy the extra you know, one there. I mean, yes, I, that's obviously what you want as an author, but yeah, I don't know if I get crucified by that or not. I was, I was saying, like, I've never, like I tell you before, I never use cliffhangers, and I did it on this one. So, be my luck, I'd get a box set, end it in the cliffhanger, and get a whole bunch of people mad at me. But, oh well, I'd well, force me to buy always, it. I mentioned this last week. You can always unpublish a boxed set later on. You know, I, I haven't True. yet, but it's not quite the same as, you know, it's just a collection of your novels that are already published. Separately. And that was my question to you. I know you've got a bunch of box sets. Have you ever unpublished one? I have not unpublished one of mine. Ones very often you'll just be running it for like three months or six months. Uh, it's like a temporary thing because people won't necessarily want to have, like if they're, 
lowering their book to 10 cents, basically, if there's 10 books in a bundle and they're 99 cents for the whole bundle. You know, and they usually sell that book for $3. They may not want to always have it in the set for such a low price. True. So a lot of times these will be for like three or six months. Yeah, I was just pretending to like like your own stuff. I know you have a lot of books out there. Like you can okay, oh yeah, here's a brand new series. I just wrote the first five books in five weeks. Let's go ahead and release them all and put a, a group to our box set together in the first three. What the heck? And so I was just wondering if you was like, okay, well I'm done with that. Let's just go ahead and get rid of it, or you just leave it there. I leave it there, and then I'll like with my Emperor's Edge and Dragon Blood series, uh, those have, have been boxed up the first three for a long time, and about once a year I'll try to get a book bub ad on them and just kind of try to keep the series alive, keep it selling, and I'll alternate between that and advertising the Perma-Free Book 1, and that gives me different stuff to, you know, give to these sponsorship sites every now and then. That's and a good idea. Something else to consider is the price of the individual titles when you're thinking, how many should I put in the box? If everything is $3.99, you're probably not going to want to box up more than three books because Amazon, after $9.99, if you go above that, you're not getting the 70% royalty anymore. They drop you down to 35%. So it's that makes absolutely no sense money. whatsoever. But yeah, I, I yeah. remember hearing about that. I was like, okay, well, there's the cap right there. <laughs> no higher than 9.99. And you can on the other sites that don't have that. I know Mark from Kobo mentioned specifically that they've got people doing like eight their whole series basically in a bundle and maybe selling it for 24.99 or 19.99. And even uh, and you could run Facebook ads and point them to that bundle at $20, and if you actually sold a couple, you could, you know, cover the cost of your Facebook ads. Maybe I've heard of people doing it. I have not done that yet, just out of laziness. I haven't tried to, well, I haven't tried a specific bundle for a specific vendor, I should say. Good to know. And um, should you go wide or KU is, you know, going to Kindle Unlimited, KDP Select, that's just dependent on you and probably going to depend honestly on just what the other three books or four books or however many in the series are doing. Right now uh, having a bundle in Kindle Unlimited can be pretty lucrative. Uh, I think we talked about that with Susan K. Quinn a couple weeks ago. But uh, since they, they cap page reads at 3,000, which is a lot, <laughs> I think most of my books are maybe 400, 500 pages. Uh, I'm not sure what the longer ones would be since I don't have any of my longer stuff in Kindle Unlimited, but that's probably, I don't know, 200, 300, 400,000 words or so before they cap anything. So you could conceivably be getting at the current rates, you know, $10 or $12 on a read, a borrow of a box set. So you could be making more from the borrow than from actually selling the books. Uh, and we don't know how long that'll last. I've kind of thought for a while that they might bring that down quite a bit. Uh, originally they didn't have a cap at all. I think this 3,000 page per book cap came in around February or so. So, you know, <laughs> that's, uh, that's something to consider if you're doing, if you're thinking, if you're on the fence with Kindle Unlimited. Uh, but however, if you ever want to get like a USA Today bestseller name or you're hoping for New York Times bestseller, which is it to be tough to do with like epic fantasy, <laughs> but it can be done. Uh, I think we, we had Michael Plouffe on the show a few months ago, and he talked about putting together a USA Today, Today run, and that'll often be done when you're doing dropping into 99 cents. You manage to get a book bub ad, and maybe you get some other smaller ads to just try to sell as many copies as you can in that week, and it can actually happen uh, with the box sets. And it's probably the best way for, outside of doing it with other authors, it's probably the best shot most of us have to get, you know, most, most of us mere mortals to hit those lists. And once you hit the list, it's kind of like, you know, you can say you were on it 20 years from now. So sometimes people have that goal of just doing it once. Yeah, okay. I, I have uh, one, one thought that I do with uh, box sets that's worked. Well, I mean, my box sets aren't uh, really about making money right now. I typically, well, here's just my policy. Uh, the three books and then a box set is what I typically do. So once the fourth book is out, I, I start thinking about boxing the first three. And because I usually do perma-free on the first book, in order to sort of justify, rather than knocking a dollar off the cost and, uh, of, of what would essentially be a free book and two not free books, I'll typically make it the cost of the two books combined, but I'll add in bonus material. And that bonus material is usually novellas or short stories that aren't available individually. And then they are available only in the, uh, in the 
box set, and also that's what I rotate into the newsletter perks. So every time a new box set comes out, I'll write two or three short stories and then you know release those to the newsletter and also in the book uh, in the in the box set, so that people have motivation to buy the box set as opposed to the individual books if they're trying to make that decision as a first time reader, and uh, and it motivates me to keep on supplying my loyal members in my newsletter with new interesting things to keep them interested in the newsletter. Are you putting uh, the, them in the newsletter so that people don't feel like even though they already bought the books individually, they, they're they like, oh, I have to buy the box set so I can get these extra stories? Yeah, I, uh, I definitely, like, I, I, I try to make it clear to people that they don't have to buy the box set just to get these short stories because it's not, I mean, Again, we're basically putting uh, the equivalent of maybe one more novel in there, and that's certainly not the not worth purchasing the same books over again. So, in order to prevent in order to prevent uh, either denying fans who already own the books from having these short stories or forcing them to double buy books, that's another reason I put them in the newsletter. I was toying with the idea of making them available for purchase only from my website as well, so that people who don't want to be on the newsletter but do want to read these stories would have a third option. But I haven't rolled that out yet because uh, my website needs a little bit of tender loving care in its basic function before I start adding new functions. All right. Yeah, I'm actually doing kind of the same thing with the sci-fi box set. I'm going to put the prequel in it, which has previously not been published. It's only been available. It's my incentive if people s subscribe to the newsletter. But I think I'm going to throw it in the box set just because I love the cover and I haven't published it yet. I'm like, but I have this great cover I paid for, so it's got to get, you know, I've got to put it out there somewhere. But yeah, I'm going to make it make sure those newsletter subscribers already have the link and can get the prequel for free and don't have to feel compelled to go check out the box set. That's actually a question I have. Speaking of the cover, do you include the covers of the individual books as images in your box sets? I have done both ways, I guess. This in this one, I'm gonna probably have him do little, you know, each little cover on the front. I saw one from Autumn Calquist. She had a sci-fi series. I think that she was the one I was looking at that sold really well, like last winter or something. And uh, she had like the three on the front, the three mini covers, and then the main book one cover, and it looked really cool. Um, I've actually, in my case, I'm still, I'm almost there, almost getting new Emperor's Edge covers for that series, but because I hadn't had new covers and I really wanted to, uh, I, I got a new box set cover, basically, that doesn't match anything else. I just said, give me a more epic fantasy looking cover. So uh, that is something you can do, too, with the box sets to give it another shot to appeal to different readers. Uh, I already mentioned tinkering and doing a different version of your blurb, but if maybe you're not that crazy about the covers you have or you're not sure they're maybe hitting the right notes that you're hoping to hit or you just want to try something new, you could do one box set cover that's something new and just try it. You never know. And it's, you're not, that way you're not committing to doing eight new covers necessarily or however long your series is. So something to think about. All right, moving on to talk about collections of short stories. Uh, again, with the solo thing, uh, we've talked about before how if you're doing short stories, usually you're kind of stuck at selling them for 99 cents. If you have enough short stories that are in the same universe or the same characters or even the same theme, if you put them together in a collection, then you can uh, sell them for 2.99 or more. And the, you know, it's at that point too, you could get a paperback done, and then you have something for signing or giving away if you do the conventions and those things. Um, I think it's going to work best as far as selling them when they're really closely linked, when it's stories in a series, novellas. Uh, I've basically done this with my Flash Gold series. They were all novellas, and I just put in together, finally I'm getting a paperback. I finished writing the series earlier in the year, with, and so there's five novellas, and I'm, uh, I've got the cover art. I just need to get the manuscript together and you know, low priority, but <laughs> finally I'll be able to do a paperback and have like, I think it ended up being 150,000 words or so, so a respectable paperback length and then some, I think. But do you guys have any thoughts on, have you done, or put together short story collections? I have, yeah. I've actually written uh, several that are same characters from my Final Fantasy series there, and and uh, I, would, I wouldn't I would sell them, though, until I actually get more than one so I can group them together because uh, I've 
even though they're short, and I'd say right on the, the blurb and everything, it's a short story. I don't just don't even if the cheapest I can do is ninety nine cents. I still don't feel comfortable charging someone that much for just a simple short story. So I'll wait sure make wait until I have a couple of them, then group them together and turn around and sell it. And actually, the one I've done has actually sold quite well. Awesome. Yeah, I uh, I probably once I end up with enough of those bonus short stories that are only in the uh, the bundles. If I have enough that it's reasonably novel length, that's another way I'll probably end up making them available without having to buy the bundle is just collect them together so that every one of my books will then be purchasable separately or as part of a bundle. But I haven't got enough of any of those yet to do that. Yeah, I'll probably do it also with my sci-fi series because I've written now three short stories, one for two for anthologies and one for a giveaway from my mailing list. So you know, a couple more <laughs> might appear down the line, and you might as well, once you have them, because people will actually ask me, uh, my Emperor's Edge series, I also did some short stories on the side, and they're like, can you put these all in one book that I can get, and I still haven't yet, because I'm a bad author, but yeah, people actually want the collection all together like that, when they're, especially when they're all the same characters, and they're into the characters. All right, moving on to multi-author box sets. And uh, the basic premise here is that you're getting together with maybe eight or ten other authors, or eight or ten total, and you're probably going to do something like take your book one, your series starter, and then you're gonna, you're all going to put your throw your book ones in there to a big collection. And these are all going to be already published books. In a lot of cases, these may be books that you've had out for years, and you're kind of looking for a way to, you know, you've already run ads on them, and you just want to get some more readers, get some more attention to the series. So what they'll do is take all these 10 full-length novels, put them together in one box set, and sell it for maybe 99 cents. Um, I've also been a part of perma-free ones, where there's the whole collection, all the novels are free. Um, but which sometimes with the 99 cents thing, what you can do is uh, if you do a pre-order, I'm probably getting ahead of myself here, but this is another way people will do to get on the USA Today bestseller list or the New York Times bestseller list is you've got so many authors that are going to plug it to their readers, to their mailing lists, and then it's only 99 cents, so it's a great deal that uh, if you combine that with doing a pre-order for a couple months, you may actually be able to move like to six or seven or 8,000, or, you know, if you, I think if you want the New York Times list, it's more like above 10 or 12,000. I've not reached those lofty goals with anything yet, so I couldn't tell you for sure. I do know it depends on the time of the year. Apparently, the summer is slower and easier to hit the list in the summer than it is like in once the school year gets started and around the holidays. It's, it's pretty tough, apparently. There's a lot of trad-published authors putting out new stuff then. So that is the premise there. And in addition to moving a whole bunch of copies, you just you're hoping that basically your books are going to get exposed to the readers of all the other authors that are in the box set and maybe you know if the if the theme is close enough if the reader like if you know I'm going to be in a space opera one and we're all going to have space opera stuff so it's possible that all of our readers may dig each other's books well, that made sense possibly so Basically, I've I've almost always in one. <laughs> I've been doing them for a couple years, and the first one, some of them have been put together with the idea of actually making some money. Um, but usually, they're always 99 cents. But if you sell enough copies, even at 90 cent, 99 cents, even divided by eight people, it you know you might get several hundred dollars for the the box set, which can be not too shabby for a book that's been out a while. And you're just hoping to, you know, especially if you're only in it for hoping to get more readers into your series, it's it's a little added bonus to actually make some money on it. Um, Joe, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I'm in a few of these, actually, in a few of these with you. But uh, uh, I agree that this is probably, like, we talked about it a little bit in the set it and forget it advertising thing that we did, but this is probably my number two biggest thing that brings people to me that, uh, like, I will get emails uh, maybe twice a month from someone who's like, oh, I, uh, I discovered your, your book as part of the Quest uh, collection. I really liked it. And uh, oddly enough, usually this is a person who has read and enjoyed the book and found my contact information but doesn't know how to buy the books individually. <laughs> so uh, I guess one point here would be to make sure that you make it clear at the end of your section where the other books are available and how to find them because... I'm sure if I did a better job with that in my back matter, I would have had a stronger sell-through because not a lot of people are willing to write the email to ask how to find the other books. Yeah, and it depends a lot on who the organizer is. And I think now a lot of people are getting really getting together and they'll give you your link to your author page, your Facebook page, Twitter, 
And here is a link to the next book in the series. And I've been with some high-speed people that will actually make a like a Kobo copy, an iTunes copy, and they'll put the links to the second book for that specific store, which is great. I'm too lazy to do that. I, I you give an EPUB and a Mobi if you do stuff with me, but uh, that no, I think that's great when they do that, and it's definitely helpful. You can't assume that people will. You know, I think a lot of people are reading these on their Kindle or their whatever, and they don't necessarily have the internet on their device where it's the browser's hokey, so they don't use it. So it doesn't quite connect. Like, how am I going to later find this author? You know, I finished this and then don't remember his name. I don't know. But yeah, the easier you can make it by putting your information at the end and a link to the next book. Definitely a good idea. And uh, as I mentioned, if you do the pre orders, that can be great for trying to hit a bestseller list. You know, if you want to do that, it's, it's ideal if you've got an organizer that's already done it before and can kind of knows all the tricks of the trade. Uh, the pre-orders, like I said, are the big way because you can stack all those, you know, whatever, 5,000 sales that you might get over the course of two months. They all count the first week that the book is published. So that's how you end up basically hitting a list. Um, short of get, outside of getting a book bub ad, for most of us, it's going to be really hard to just sell five or six or seven or 8,000 copies of a book in a week, however many you need. So in most of these cases, this is like a one week only, you're going to appear on the USA Today. You know, they, I think they go to up to 150 bestsellers. And um, as I mentioned before, if that is your goal, you need to be wide. You can't just be on Amazon. They take the data points from, I believe, at least two stores. So you also need to sell like 500 copies at Barnes & Noble or Apple in order to, to get counted. I think Kobo, I think Mark said that he also, they also send in the data, but because a lot of their sales are going to be Canadian and other countries, you might, you know, obviously you need U.S. sales if you're going to be on the USA Today list or the New York Times bestseller list. Not that we don't love other sales, but that's a, if you want to get those lists, that's what you're going for. And, you know, like I was saying, this can be a good way to revive an older series or just if sales have slowed down on book one. And, you know, we're always struggling. It's not just you. It's all of us. Those of us, we've, especially after you've finished a series, you're really struggling to keep it alive. You start to feel like, oh, I've, you know, I've run this ad 50 times or, you know, three times I've got an ad here. And, you know, even BookBub, as great as they are, I feel like I've heard different things in different genres, but I I feel like with fantasy and science fiction, your first one is going to be your best one. And you can still get a great return on future times you run it, but after a while you feel like they may not take your book again or it's just not going to be that useful, as useful as it once was. So this is another way to keep things going. And it should I should point out, it should go without saying that the first book in your series obviously needs to be a pretty good book in order to, <laughs> if the whole point is to get people to buy the rest of the books in your series, make sure if you can, maybe book one's got a little bit of a teaser for book two or a little, I don't know, cliffhangers. Jeff doesn't like those cliffhangers, but apparently, <laughs> apparently hey, they it, work. Hey, it works, yeah. I, I did that for number three and it sold a lot of copies of number four. And thankfully all the reviewers said it's a good thing you didn't have to wait too long, so... If you use Cliffhanger, don't make them wait. I think the best way I've found that for me where I'm comfortable doing it and I don't get yelled at too much by the readers is where there's an ongoing story arc and you're dying to know how it resolves, but each individual book, the, the little, you know, there's some resolution and stuff in that each individual book. But, yeah, if you've got something else that keeps them wanting to read on and see whatever happens, you know, that, that seems like a good way. All right. Um, I think that's. Uh, if you're gonna, I guess in my notes here, I have uh, one thing I was gonna say is you can't get a BookBub ad for these. They will not take the multi-author box sets of the previously published novels. They will take new uh, or short stories. I'm not sure why the difference there, but that's what I've been told. So if you're doing novels, it, you do are, are going to be kind of relying on people's mailing lists for marketing. Uh, some of the other promo sites will advertise these, but don't uh, count on getting a book, Bob, to get those 8,000 <laughs> sales that you're hoping to get. Um, some of the other ones will, but like I said, power the mailing list. And so you want to get a couple of heavy hitters in there if you can, people that you know, like are in your genre and probably have a good size mailing list and already sell pretty well. 
and it's, you know, of course it's also okay to put in some uh, young blood, somebody who maybe only has a couple novels out and isn't selling as well. Sometimes those people are less busy and actually end up really being proactive and being really helpful in promoting the set. Uh, a lot of times when, I'll just <laughs> say for myself, I have my, always doing a lot of different things with the promo thing, so I'm less likely today to like want to do blog posts and interviews and, and that kind of thing to help launch something like this. I just mail it to my list and, and hit the social media and that's kind of what you get. But um, So it can be a good to have a mix of, of older established people, older, more the people have been publishing longer and have a <laughs> big audience and some of the new folks. And as I've said on here before, if nobody's inviting you to these box sets, start one of your own. It's That's kind of how a lot of people cut their teeth and get in it. And you know, once you've actually organized one or two, you might start to become somebody that people know are doing these and you might get invited to more of them. Um, usually with these multi-author box sets, as I said, it's usually old, somebody's older fiction, older novels that they've had out for a while and they don't mind selling it for the equivalent of 10 cents, basically, because they have more books in their series that they're hoping to sell. I've been asked before to write a novel fresh for one of these box sets, and I just was like, no. Uh, <laughs> I think that's going to be the response from most people. Do they, give you, that do they are, give you much notice when they do something like that? It's like, hey, we like you in a box set. We need a brand new story. <laughs> they will. They'll, you know, a lot of people like plan nine or twelve months out for something like that. But you, anybody that's actually got a fan base built up and has a readership, they're going to make way more money selling a book on their own than they are putting it in the, one of these discount box sets. So sometimes get people to do short stories, which brings me into the last little topic I wanted to talk about is the uh, multi-author anthologies with short stories or novellas, and um. I've been in a couple of these too, uh, one with my pen name, I got invited to one and I had to write a new novella, which was okay for the pen name and we only had it exclusive in the set for like three months and then you could publish it on your own, so that that was fine with me. And uh, that actually ended up getting my pen name a USA Today credit because we d did exactly what I was saying, we took these anthologies, or this anthology of sh novellas put it out in pre-order for a couple months, and sold it at 99 cents, hit all our lists and were able to sell enough copies that first week that it, it got onto the USA Today list. And uh, that is going to be something that's easier to do with brand new unpublished fiction because all of your readers, one of the things with the box sets, like I'm in one right now with The Emperor's Edge, is like everybody on my list has read that book or <laughs> dismissed it as something they don't want to read. Whereas if I wrote something new, you know, using characters that they're already like, they're more likely to go out and buy it, right? So there's definitely a plus if you can do new fiction, but usually that's going to be more likely with short stories or novellas. And then not everybody's going to say yes. It just depends on the person. Uh, I'm in an anthology right now for the science fiction series, and that was because I was starting in a new genre, so I was willing to do it. I wanted to help kick it off and get more people reading it. And we just made that anthology of short stories perma-free from the start. We were just hoping to get folks into it to try them out and hopefully go on and, you know, with mine I've got two characters from the series in the short story, so it's sort of a, a, you know, if you like this you'll probably like the whole series, so come check it out. And that was the whole point of it for me. For the record, your short stories, what's the size of your short stories? Technically a short story is supposed to be 8,000 words or less, maybe even 7,500 words or less. Let me rephrase that. What are your <laughs> short stories? I'm not that bad. I think I've been around 12,000 words for these. So they're technically novelettes, I believe. Um, that's just, it's hard for me to take character, characters that are existing and come up with a good adventure. I write my short stories like that, adventures with characters I have, as opposed to writing kind of idea short stories with literary merit. Nothing wrong with those. I'm not sure they're going to suck people into your series so much. I very, very much intend to like show this is my characters. They're fun characters. You want to read this series. That's my goal with these. I'm not trying to sell these to analog or whatever, <laughs> whatever yeah. fantasy and sci-fi magazine that gets awards. Yeah, that's pretty much what I do. It's like hey, you already know that you've read the stories. You know the characters. You know the setting. Here's a quick little blurb about something that they've done. So that works well. 
I will say to make sure to make your short story a standalone complete adventure because you'll always see this in reviews and even though I actually I thought that's kind of what we had in our anthology we still have reviews that are like oh this is a ripoff these are just teasers meant to hook people into getting the series they're they're not complete stories and I'm like it's free why are you complaining <laughs> but they will complain so I think and I think too people want a complete story um, and they're actually going to be more interested in seeing more of what you've offered if you've fully entertained them for their free, perma-free download. It's true. All right. I, I got to say, uh, uh, I've been in a couple of these and uh, a couple of original. You have a better chance of these to getting, if you are in it for prestige, these I have found have a much better chance of actually winning any sort of accolade. The only technical, if I'm going to stick the words award winning on my name, the only thing I've ever done that earned that was I was a part of a, a Ragnarok publishing did a thing called Blackguards, and I was in it, one of 30 authors that was in it, and it won an, a Reddit award called a Stabby. Uh, so if you get enough people together, like this is, uh, I've found, especially because it's new and it's not, it's, it's not just a marketing tactic. It's also potentially a way to test out new material. So the, you have a, a strong propensity for higher quality stuff, especially if you can get some reasonably big names in it. A uh, stabby? A stabby, yes. Reddit uh, <laughs> r slash fantasy stabby. Okay, I'll just make sure I heard that right. Like stabby, stab a person, stabby, stabby. Okay. Yeah, you, I, apparently the, the editor of the, uh, the collection would receive an engraved dagger as the award. I, I didn't get one. <laughs> engraved dagger, that's awesome. <laughs> All right, my life will not be complete until I've won that award, so I'll, I'll have to look into it. In your case, it was an editor that put together the anthology, wasn't it? Yeah. And it was a mix of trad published authors and indie authors? Yes, it authors. was. I was invited into it because I had been in part of an earlier anthology put together by someone who handed it off to this editor. So, yeah, I, I sort of lucked out with that one, I feel. But, and also, I mean, in those cases, because it was trad published, I got paid for it as opposed to writing it with the hopes of uh, enticing people into my series. Yeah, and that's perfectly legitimate and a great thing can be a great thing too. Uh, sometimes some of these anthologies actually pay pro rates so you could conceivably get paid for your story and then when you get the rights back you know they often want the electronic rights for like a year or something like that you could just go on and publish it on your own too. So it's good to kind of have that brainstorming session ahead of time when you start putting the group together you know what is our goal for this and that goes or do we just want to sell as many and make some money? Because, uh, you know, you can sell these at $2.99 if you actually want to make money or put them in Kindle Unlimited. Or are we just are we trying to get the USA Today list? Or are we just trying to get as many readers as possible to check it out? So we'll do perma-free. So there's all sorts of different strategies and, that are valid for these kind of things. And um, like I said, with the, before the book bub, they will take the anthologies. So... Uh, sometimes it can make sense. Um, I think the one that we got taken, uh, taken, yeah, the pen name one was put on, was accepted by BookBub, and what we did with that one, this was about a year ago, we launched it at 99 cents, had done the pre-order, got as many sales as we could. Once things started uh, tapering off, we raised it to 2.99, I believe, and then we left it there for a couple months and then applied for the BookBub. So it ended up kind of getting a second wind, second run with that. Uh, I think we had it together for six months before unpublishing it. But um, BookBub will generally want to see a discounted book, as we've talked about before. So it might be easier, an easier sell for them if you're going from $3.99 to $99. Or uh, if it's always $99, you can't get a sale. You have to go to perma. You have to go to free. It's the only way to go from there. Um, yeah. Do you guys have any other thoughts on that? Oh, my last thought, my last note on the anthology is just to uh, watch out if your goal is to get more readers. You know, it's, like I said, it's kind of a different thing if you're just trying to get paid for it, and you know, that's the end of that. Um, watch out for the really obscure themes. Uh, something about editors of anthologies, they they have interesting ideas, and they're like, yeah, let's do octopuses. Is, or, you know, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea inspired fiction, and so you can end up writing a story for this thing. Hopefully they're going to accept it, but then if they didn't, you're stuck with this really off the beats, you know, <laughs> off the wall story. And also, I've never seen one of these that sells well. Uh, be very careful, because a lot of times uh, the editors that put these together, they're like really, uh, they can be really good people, really well respected in the 
you know, in the community, but they are not going to be the same as somebody who's sold piles and piles of books over here on Amazon and knows how to really hustle and market and sell books. So, uh, like I said, I've just never seen one of these really obscure theme things <laughs> do really well. So be careful with that. I say as I've gotten myself into one that uh, I'm actually excited about it. The theme is it's for a charity, that, charity though, so I think it'll be pretty awesome. But just make sure it's something you want to write anyway, and that you're excited about. And don't. Uh, and if you're putting one together yourself, be careful with the theme being too tight knit. Like I think space opera is great. That's perfect. There's it's wide enough that there's an audience for it, and you can get a lot of people to check it out. Yeah, right. I agree. The best, the best ones that I've I've been a part of a, a handful of these, and the best ones are always like based upon a fairly vague. Uh, theme like one of them was re rediscovery, one of them was rogues. The blackers one was rogues. Um, I, I'm in one now or working on one that's a uh, lone wolf. Like very basic that you could take in a thousand different directions. Because if it's a really tight subject, then you're going to end up with 15 stories that are almost identical. So you got to watch out for that. All right. Well, and then the last thing is if you're putting these together. Ha, I said the last thing before, but I have all these notes on my notes. <laughs> if you're putting one together, think about whether you want to offer to pay authors or if you want to do a royalty split thing. And I, I think either way is fine. If you offer to pay them, I think there's more chance that they might check out on you. They, oh, I got my $200. I, that's all I have to do. And maybe I'll announce it to my newsletter or something. But if they're depending on making a portion of the royalties, I think they're going to hustle a little more and really be proactive in the marketing and trying to get the word out. So, again, depends on what your goal is. If you don't want all their help, you just want to do your, you know, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea inspired theme fiction, then <laughs> pay them and be done with them. <laughs> so it's, it's up to your, your goals. But just to kind of wrap things up, no matter what you're doing, box sets can definitely be helpful in selling more books and keeping your older series alive and selling, maybe getting you in the eyes of some new readers. Uh, if you haven't done it yet, consider it. <laughs> All right, any closing thoughts, guys? Uh, no, that pretty much covers it for me. That's, yeah, I, I enjoy the box sets. I've been, I participated in a couple of them. They worked well. So if you're given the option or if you're invited, do it. If you're not invited, create one anyways and invite some other authors. You'll be surprised. Yeah, the only thing I might add is uh, all of this information is primarily useful for the ebook version. There are certain situations where making an actual, like, especially if you have, say, extremely long books and you put five of them in a, uh, in a collection, you might actually produce a paperback that is too big or way too expensive to actually produce. So focusing on this for, for, for electronic formats is better than physical formats. Right. Very good point. <laughs> With the exception of the short story anthologies, uh, we actually did a paperback of the space opera one I'm in, and it looks pretty cool. So, All right. Cool. Uh, lastly, I oh yeah, I was going to say, we always ask other authors to say where they can find their books and stuff. Do you guys want to mention your book, whatever book one or whatever you're working on that you hope people will check out? Uh, well, the fantasy book I'm just getting ready to release, or release it, finish up, is in my Tales of Lantari uh, series. The first one is Permafree, that's Lost City, um, available pretty much anywhere. It's not uh, in KU or anything, so you can find it just about everywhere. Uh, all my books and everything, everything about them, you can find on my website, which is uh, authorjmpool.com. That's it for me. Authorjmpool.com. Yeah, it used to be Lentari. <laughs> it used used to be lentari.com, and then when I released the mystery, I realized, okay, I can't use it as my main website anymore. I've got to figure out how to get something more generic. I waited too long. My full name.com was taken. It's like, ah, figures. So I did that one. Then I had to, I won't go into that mess now. WordPress, don't screw around with it unless you don't know, unless you know what you're doing or you're going to create a hell of a mess. All right. I will say that Lois McMaster Brujold has the website dendari.com for her homepage, and that's from her or Cossigan series, but she's written a whole bunch of other stuff since then, and she still has that site. So, yeah, I still have it. It just as soon as you go yeah. to lentari.com, it automatically directs you over to the authorjmpool.com. She registered her domain name in 1997. It says so wow. <laughs> if you were back on the web then and got a, now you, it's hard to find something that's only six or seven letters. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Joe. Anything you want to share? 
Uh, sure. Um, my I did not take the advice of making a generic name, so uh, www.bookofdeacon.com is still where you can find everything about my Book of Deacon series, my Big Sigma series, and my Free Run series, because heaven forbid I, I, you know, I actually do have a fairly short one based on my name, but it's based on a nickname, the one where there's it's just J.O. Lalo, and that's not currently set up for anything, but I own the site, so maybe someday. And uh, I have permafreeze in my three main series, so... Uh, you know, uh, the Book of Deacon, um, Bypass Gemini for the Big Sigma series, and then the Free Wrench for the Free Wrench series. So check any of them out, and if you like them, there's plenty more where all of those came from. All right, thanks. And you guys can find me at lindsaybaroker.com, which is probably harder to spell than Lentari, but uh, if you get anywhere close, Google will help you out. <laughs> there and, you go. Uh, you can grab Star Nomad, the first book in my Fallen Empire science fiction series, or The Emperor's Edge and Balanced on the Blade's Edge in my two fantasy series are perma-free for right now. So uh, we appreciate you guys listening to us. And as we tend to forget, we have a Facebook page. Uh, I'm going to try to actually remember to put the show up this week. <laughs> but uh, marketing, <laughs> what is it, science fiction and fantasy marketing show on Facebook, if you look it up, come on by. We're going to try to get something rolling where you can actually ask questions a little more easily. Uh, right now, we just have people sending it through the contact form on marketingsff.com. But, uh, yeah, come on by the Facebook page. Come find us on our website. Leave comments. Let us know what you want to see going forward. And uh, we appreciate you listening. Thanks, right. everyone. Guys, take it easy. Thanks, everybody.